seconds about me first. My name is Neeraj Mohanka, or as uh, everybody at work calls me, Raj Mohanka. So I grew up here. My parents came in the 60s. I'm second generation. So um, I got interested in endology and all this stuff just kind of on my own, just natural curiosity. I started looking into things probably late high school, early college. And I've been doing it now for you know, well over 30 years. So I had the, the good fortune of meeting some excellent people like uh, Dr. Elst and uh, reading their books and all the research. And uh, so when the opportunity came to host here from the mainland, I jumped to it. So a little bit of background, you may already know about me, but Conrad Elf, uh, the Belgian Orientalist and Indologist. Relations and human history. He was born into a Flemish Catholic family. Some of his family members were Christian missionaries. He graduated in Indology, Synology, and Philosophy at Catholic University of Lubin. Around that time, uh, Dr. Elf became interested in Flemish nationalism. Between 1988 and 1992, he was at Benares Hindu University. In 1999, he received a PhD from Catholic University of Lubin. His doctoral dissertation on Hindu revivalism was published as a book, Decolonizing the Hindu Mind. He is known for his support for the out of India theory related to Indo-Aryan migration. He's also written about multiculturalism, language policy issues, ancient Chinese philosophy and history, and comparative religion. He became identified with Hindutva politics during the 1990s, following his support for the Bharatiya Janata Party's position on the Ram Janmabhumi Temple in Ayodhya, and in parallel with the BJP's rise to prominence on the national stage. Uh, he's, I can't even list all the books you've written, Conrad. I think it's, was it 30 or something? More than 30? Uh, and thousands of articles. I've read pretty much everything he's done. He has a blog site. I checked that almost daily. Uh, he's amazing depth of knowledge. So after the presentation, I'm hoping for a fantastic Q&A session. We can go, I think, infinitely deep. All right. So with that, Dr. Host. Thank you, Niraj, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to talk about the um, homeland debate of uh, Indo-European, or as it used to be called, Aryan. So, we have an Indo European family, that is to say, a family of languages that unites most European and most North Indian languages. Iranian. They are uh, deemed to have a common origin. A single language, putative language, which we may attempt to reconstruct, but of course, which is not attested in writing, namely Proto Indo European. And to get at this, uh, what we do is to, is to apply in reverse the processes that are observed in actual ongoing language change. You see, Languages uh, tend to split apart. If there was not modern communication, then by now American, British, Australian, English would have been separate languages. Or on the way to becoming so. So that's the sort of normal process that has been going on throughout history. So the uh, the Aryan languages came all together from something close to Sanskrit, and that came from Proto-Indo-European, which then in turn uh, can be postulated to be the sister of several other language families that all together were one language called Nostratic, which was spoken by 50,000 or so years ago. And so if you go back farther up in the history of mankind, we come to a moment where there's only one language of which perforce all languages in the world descended. And in effect, there are a few roots that are present in every language, or close to, with a related uh, meaning. Like you have a root milk, which you find in milk, and which originally refers to the act of suckling a baby and therefore all kinds of derived meanings are either to suck or to suckle, uh, throat, uh, milk, 
uh, and, and then at farther removed uh, to digest, uh, and so on and so on. Um, you know, so you have a few of those words, but they won't help you much to speak uh, the language of the Bushman or so. Um, so they are there, and uh, a little bit closer, a little bit more related are families like, like Indo-European. Um, so they have no practical value, but it's interesting to know the history. Just like when you walk past, let's say, a cathedral, you know, you may want to know more about it. If you don't, you know, you won't die, but what us historians do happens to be interesting. Um, this uh, Indo-European family is fairly well grounded in the sense that we don't have to just imagine things. There are several of its daughter languages that are known, and if we take these together, then we can more or less reconstruct the original. These are Vedic Sanskrit, which has been deemed to be about 1500 BC at the earliest. But we will go into that question. Then uh, Hittite and Mycenaean and Greek, who are both of effectively that age. So this, um, this original language is um, reconstructed by comparative historical linguistics. Now many people in India, I've noticed, totally reject this whole idea of an Indo-European family. See, they think it is uh, very demeaning for Sanskrit be brought into contact with any other, and especially foreign language. So in their opinion, the question where this homeland was doesn't, uh, doesn't come into the picture, because there, there, there was no homeland or anything, because there never was an Indo-European family. And there was no crossing of the Khyber Pass, either by invaders or by immigrants. All languages remain the same, or they don't know about the foreign languages because they don't, these don't interest them at all. If the, if the European languages are cognate or, or, or anything, you know, let them go to hell. They are not important. Only Sanskrit is important. Uh, you have a, a similar attitude, but for totally different reasons in Europe, very, very, very sparsely. Uh, you have a French scholar Dumoul uh, who argues against the existence ever of this uh, Proto-Indo-European mother tongue and especially of the people who spoke it because he thinks that that is the beginning, the beginning of racism. You know, if you, if you assume that a community exists, then it should follow that you end up hating all the other communities. Uh, well, you know, scholarly insights do not work that way, because even if they are inconvenient to your political reflections, they may nevertheless have happened uh, that way. So, um, so I will continue to assume that if ever this language was spoken, Proto-European, there was a community that spoke it. You see, today a language can have a completely virtual existence uh, on the internet. You may this, you know, invent the language of the elves and then make an internet course and then hope that people, you know, Australia or somewhere are going to take up your course and that this is going to become the new world language. But you see, in those days it didn't work like that. Uh, in India, you have a uh, proud linguistic tradition going back to the, at, least, uh, at least the first millennium BC, maybe earlier. And so there were already a number of grammarians whose work was synthesized and improved upon by Pali, uh, who is located conventionally about 500 BC. He taught at the University of uh, Takshashila, Vedic University, I'm very glad oldest university in the world. 
But you see, he was a great linguist, and his own, his own concepts, his own approach revolutionized European scholarship and effectively led to the creation of modern science of linguistics. So that's great. However, in this particular discipline of comparative historical linguistics, he is rather useless because he focused on one language, uh, not really in a diachronic perspective, certainly not in a comparative perspective. He, he lived uh, somewhere near uh, what is now Rawal or Shishawar in Pakistan, which is in contact, in immediate contact with the foreign language, and the Iranian. Very probably he also knew or knew of uh, nearby Guru Shafi and Tibetan. Yet, you see, this play no role at all in his linguistic speculations. He talks about Sanskrit. And so, you see, the only use that has been made of these classical grammarians by modern Indian uh, polemicists is this, that um, the word Arya, uh, of which uh, European scholars in the 19th century made Aryan, meaning Indo-European, that you see that word in the definitions it is given, or the descriptions it is given in, for instance, the Mahabharata, never has a, the meaning of a race. There was no Aryan race. Now you see that it's slamming an open door because after 1945, at least, no scholar ever says Aryan race. You see, the people who spoke in the European were a separate race. That's just not done anymore, that's not believed by anyone. So if you can prove that Aryan was something else than a race, you know, that doesn't mean anything to anyone. That only means that you just are not aware of the state of the art. The uh, reconstructions are marked by an asterisk. That is to say, a little star. So forms that are deduced from presently existing forms that are supposed to have existed at the origin of the now attested forms, they are marked by an asterisk. And so um, there's a book of mine called Asterisk in Arupiyastham. Um, you see, the word asterisk in French has a uh, given rise to the creation of a comic strip character, Asterix. And he always goes somewhere. Uh, Asterix in Britannia, you know, Asterix in Spain. Um, so I've made a variation of this. I've said Asterix in Baru Piastam. What is Baru Piastam? It is the name of this homeland. Um, Baru Pia is a, you know, Contraction of um, Bharatiya and Europea, meaning uh, Indian and European. And Stam, of course, is country. So Bharatiya Stam is the country of the Indo Europeans. Only, you know, it's a big question where this country was located. In fact, that's what the whole debate is about. In uh, India, I hear many people say, oh, this is just a ghost language, this is a language that never existed, and so on. Well, you see these uh, linguists in their dusty libraries, they do occasionally uh, make their case more credible. There have been a number of discoveries that fit into the, the hypotheses that they created. Um, for example, we know that the uh, Romance languages, French, Italian, uh, Spanish, and so on, that they descend from vulgar Latin rather than from literary Latin. Now, we have plenty of texts in literary Latin. Now, you can compare it to Sanskrit. You know, all these modern Indian languages like Bengali, Gujarati, and so on, they do not descend from literary Sanskrit. They descend from the colloquial forms of you know, related to Sanskrit that were effectively spoken in North India at that time. So here, similar. Now, we can't get at this colloquial Latin, we only have literary Latin, until 
the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum were dug up, you know, that had been uh, conserved underneath the volcano uh, lava. And there you found a lot of graffiti written in vulgar Latin. And so they confirmed the tentative reconstructions of proto-Italian, proto-French, and so that had been made. Or for example, um, a uh, 19th century French linguist, Fernando Saussure, uh, postulated that the original uh, Proto-Indo-European had had laryngeal sounds, that is throat sounds, similar to Arabic, like <coughs> Ali, you know, the uh, nephew of Muhammad was called Ali. Ali, as people say usually. So you see that those sounds, those throat sounds, he claimed also existed in uh, in original uh, proto indo european And he deduced that from the traces they left in, for example, Vedic scansion, that is to say the application of a verse meter, where some unexpected divisions into uh, syllables took place. So he thought, you see, there must have been a consonant here that is now no longer pronounced, but it was there, and effectively it turned out to be there in Hittite, a language discovered only in uh, 1915, thereabouts, uh, which did have these sounds, whereas all the other daughters of Proto-Indo-European had lost these sounds. So once in a while, things that are just not even discovered, that are invented by reconstruction, turn out to have really existed. Sometimes also the picture uh, that the scholars create is being corrected by new discoveries. For example, you have a, a famous division in European into the Kentum and the Southern languages, that means uh, originally, it must have had a K sound, which in some languages, in some contexts, became CH, and then later SH and S. Um, like the word Kentum itself gives a good example. You see, in Latin you still say Kentum, but in Italian you say Cento, and in English it becomes a cent, like a century, a percentage. Um, so in that case, you see, there's a, a Cantum Latin, a Cantum language, namely Latin, that has been satamized later. But you see, you have this satam phenomena earlier. Sanskrit, for example, you say, for instance, octo in, in Greek and Latin, which means eight. In Sanskrit, it becomes ashta. All right. It's a very normal, common language phenomenon which you find in very many languages. Like for instance, Peking becoming Beijing. That's that same uh, phenomenon. Um, okay. Now, what was thought originally was that these Cantum languages were all the Western languages, Celtic, uh, Germanic, Greek, and the Southern languages were the Eastern languages like Slavic, uh, Sanskrit, Iranian. But then, two languages have been discovered. First, Tocharian in uh, the west of the present People's Republic, and Proto-Bangani, that is to say a layer of old words underneath, you know, but still present in Bangani, which is a dialect spoken in Uttarakhand somewhere uh, in North India. And so they turned out to be Cantum languages. Like, for instance, you have the word Dokru, which means ear, which should have become Dashru if it had been an Indian type language. But you see, it's a, it's a, it's a Cantum language, so it's Dokru. And the strange thing about it is how did those Cantum languages get there? You see, if you think that the homeland was in Europe, then this means that some of these Cantum languages did not go west, but somehow made a really big detour and landed up somewhere in the, in the, at the eastern end of the Indo-European expanse. Uh, so that's very significant. So far, nobody has drawn any conclusions from it, 
I have a conclusion, and we, they are there in the Far East because that's where they originated. You see, originally you had all Cantu languages spoken in North India. <clears throat> then some of these uh, dialects moved out, went all the way to Europe. Four spread locally, went to some valley somewhere in the lower Himalayas, or stayed there, or went to Western China. Then the situation changed inside the homeland itself, where a cup became ch or s. So then you got the southern language, and then they also moved out to Russia or to Armenia. <clears throat> But so that's how you get Cantum languages both in the West and the East. Uh, so, you know, as reality um, becomes better known, it turns out that this hypothesis sometimes needs a little correction. But by and large, these hypotheses turn out to be pretty good and pretty robust uh, against the confrontation with reality. Uh, the uh, idea of a kinship between Indian and European languages started to be intuited in the 16th century by travelers to, um, to India who noticed a number of similarities, which you immediately see in the system of pronouns and in the system of numbers, like a uh, tree or anything looking like it appears both in English, in Latin, in Greek, but also in Sanskrit, meaning Greek. Uh, this was systematized and then elaborated by Gaston Laurent, a Jesuit living in India. In 1767, he sent a paper detailing his findings to the French Academy of Sciences that perhaps could be termed the birth date of Indo-European, but that is something that was known only to a handful of scholars. Whereas um, the whole state of the art was made known to the world by William Jones, a judge for the uh, uh, East India Company in Kolkata. Uh, so there was a very interesting theory. It was rejected by many Hindus. It still is still today, because they want nothing to do <coughs> with the world outside India. In fact, I can tell you on Twitter and so on, I very regularly get very hateful messages from Hindus that this foreigner, this trust this or never trust foreigners. Okay. Um, this, um, this new discovery was welcomed in the spirit of the times in Europe in the 18th century. <coughs> there were post-Christian so-called free thinkers like Voltaire who <coughs> were very happy to trace the sources of European culture to India because they wanted to emancipate themselves from the cultural imprint of the Bible. Likewise, Immanuel Kant, the uh, most famous European philosopher. <coughs> now, it was thought in the beginning that Sanskrit is the most perfect of these languages and the most original one, the closest to the ancestral Proto-Indo-European language. <coughs> if not equal to it. For example, it has a complete declension system with three numbers, not only singular and plural, but also dual, and eight declension cases, including an instrumental case and a locative case. And these disappeared in the other languages, but leave left some traces in some old expressions. Like for instance, in Latin you have domi. You see, this is an otherwise non-existing 
case ending of do mus which means house. Do mi means in the house, at home. Ghar, ghar. So otherwise this ending doesn't exist anymore, but there it has remained. So you can see when, when you notice the difference between the six cases of Latin and the eight cases of Sanskrit, that it's not Latin that represents the original case and Sanskrit that has added a few things. No, it's the reverse. Sanskrit is the original form. Latin has retained some traces, but has evolved. So there was a big temptation to simply equate Proto-Indo-European with Sanskrit. Um, and so it was readily assumed, or not really theorized, but it was assumed that India was the uh, homeland and emigrations from India had brought these languages to Europe. This is, for example, uh, prominent in the work of uh, Friedrich von Schlegel, a German who in 1808 published a book called uh, Language and Wisdom of the Indians. So that was the, really in the spirit of Indomania, which was not to remain, uh, first of all because fashions come and go, but also specifically because the status of India went down. India used to be a, a strange, mysterious, exotic country in the distance with which Europe traded. Initially, the East India Company was a trading company that was uh, obeying the uh, Mughal Empire and was playing the game of being subservient to the Mughal Empire. Later, it became dominant and took control of India, and India became a mere colony. So then the status of India in popular culture in Europe also declined. So into the 19th century, uh, you had the uh, out of India theory, as it has been called recently. But you had that same theory out of India, with the idea that India itself was the homeland, already in around 1800. So there are people who tell you that the out of India theory is a concoction of the ugly, vicious uh, Hindu to movement. That is not the case at all. It was coined in Europe uh, when there was no Hindu Tom movement yet. But then gradually um, the realization dawned that there must have been already a certain linguistic evolution between Proto Indo European and Sanskrit. For example, your example I gave already Okto becomes Ashta. So both the, um, the K consonant changed and the vowel O. Um, or for instance, the verb to come in the past tense is uh, in the perfect tense, is gegoma. This becomes jegoma. So this, this K becomes C or G becomes J, right? Uh, Sound-wise, uh, so gegoma becomes jegoma. Then, under the influence of the vowel a, the g becomes j. Whereas, under the influence of the o, <coughs> the second uh, g remains. Right. So gegoma becomes jegoma, and then the vowels change. A becomes a, o also becomes a, and you get jagama as you have in Sanskrit. You follow? <clears throat> so therefore it became clear that uh, there had already been a linguistic evolution before Sanskrit. And so the fact that there was a distance linguistically between Proto-Indo-European and Sanskrit was translated into a geographical distance between the homeland and India. Now, in fact, that is a not very logical procedure because languages don't have to move in order to change. The ancient Chinese is very different from modern Chinese, but it has always remained in the same place. 
Uh, but anyway, that's that's what happened. <coughs> so at the end of the 19th century, Friedrich Max Müller, for example, said that the homeland is somewhere in the east. We don't know where, but somewhere in the east. And other people said, no, it's in the west. You know, it started in Europe, and then they went all the way to India. It could be in Germany, it could be in the Balkans, it could be in Anatolia. That's another popular country. <coughs> Or since the 19, 1970s, it is widely accepted that it was in the Pontic area, which is eastern Ukraine, southwestern Russia. So between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And so that is now the dominant homeland theory. That is what the out of India theory is up against. <coughs> Meanwhile, the archaeologists discovered the Harappan cities, and they changed the picture somewhat. You see, at first it was thought that the Aryans had come out from Asia, from Europe or thereabouts, went into India and brought civilization. That was like a mirror image of the process of colonization that was happening at that time. Now, I don't know if the behavior of the colonizers was all that civilized, but at least subjectively, that was the idea in Europe that we are bringing the light of civilization to the united, uh, pagan, uh, backward, you know, aboriginals. So, Max Müller had a purely speculatively, he had no objective ground to do so. Uh, assumed that this invasion into India took place in about 1500 BC. Now with the discoveries of the cities that suggested a scenario, namely that the Aryans had broken into India and destroyed the civilization. Because the end of these cities of Harappa seemed to coincide in time with the Aryan invasion. So the first idea was um, that the Aryans had destroyed um, had destroyed the Harappan cities, or you know, as uh, I think Mortimer Wheeler said, head of the Archaeological Survey of India, Indra stands accused. Is he referring to mainly? Uh, hymns in the Rig Veda of the Battle of the Ten Kings, uh, where Indra is uh, worshipped by the Aryans and implored to give them victory, and then they get victory against uh, people who are described as the Asikni Visha. The Visha is the tribe, the people. Asikni means black. And so from there, from that little translation, uh, it derived the whole edifice <coughs> of uh, the idea that the white invaders came into India and defeated the black aboriginals. So that's like the basis of the whole racial theory that was to develop in the later 19th century. And that has had a pretty famous or notorious history in it early 20th century. Mm. We'll come back to that, but meanwhile the, the history goes on. The Art of India theory has been revived. The um, starting year for that revival is the 1982, when K.D. Setna, who was then already an old man, but who had been the secretary of Sri Aurobindo, uh, when he published the book Karpasa, uh, the um, cotton in prehistoric India. Karpasa means cotton. And so his discovery, which he documents uh, widely, is that uh, cotton was already amply present in the Arab cities, but was unknown to the Igreda from which he deduces that the Rig Veda must therefore be not post-Harappan, but pre-Harappan. So the Harappan cities, in, I mean, 
that civilization is many thousands of years old, but at least its urban form, the city building, is mainly from about 2,600. So the Rigveda must be older than that, 3,000 or so BC. Uh, the main center, uh, you know, the first cities were discovered along the Indus River, Harappa and Mohenjo Daro. That's why it used to be called the Indus culture. But then many more cities have been discovered to the east, not only in Punjab and Haryana. In Haryana, along a dried up riverbed where once the mighty Saraswati grew, but also in Gujarat. And there is a second very important center in Gujarat, a city like Gothal. Um, so it's a very large civilization, larger than Mesopotamia and Egypt combined. It was then the demographic heavyweight of the world. Some, um, some so-called eminent historians, that's what the communist historians in India call themselves, or call one another, uh, the eminent historians have been saying, you see, this whole Saraswati is a mythical river, it never existed, it was concocted by the Abhuvisis Hindu nationalists. Well, in fact, you see, the Saraswati has been uh, documented and claimed to exist since the 1850s, and it started with a French scholar and then many other European scholars, Oral Stein, for instance, if that name rings a bell. And so this has nothing at all to do with Hindu politics. This is just, you know, a solid uh, historical fact. So that means that the Vedas were written along the Saraswati River, which is like just uh, outside of Delhi. You can go there from Delhi by car in two hours or so. Uh, I very much advise you to go there. I had a really good time in Kurukshetra and Pihova. Um, so it's, it's there and it's still real India. It's not congested and hot and terrible like, like Delhi. You know, it's just a pleasant city. Uh, or not even a city, it's like a place. Now, um, so that's the Vedic heartland. That's not necessarily the Proto-Indo-European homeland. Because, you see, the Indo-Aryan languages, as the North Indian languages are called, they already had a certain spread out, one of which was where the Vedic tribe lived, along the Saraswati, but it covered already much of North India. And it's not necessarily so that the Vedic area was the first to be inhabited by them. And in fact, the Hindu tradition itself says that it was somewhere else that it all originated. Namely, in Ayodhya, which is in eastern Uttar Pradesh, or like fairly precisely in the middle of North India, uh, where Manu is said to have landed after the flood, set up his dynasty, and then it one of his sons started a solar dynasty that remained in Ayodhya, to which Rama belonged. And then his eldest daughter, in fact his first child was a daughter, so she couldn't inherit the throne. That was Pila. She moved out to what is now Prayag, Dahabad. And so there her son started the lunar dynasty. And from that lunar dynasty, there's so many of generation, you see, this prince moved out to the west, to the Saraswati area. This is uh, Nahusha. And then his son, Yayati, had five sons himself. One of whom was Puru, that was his most beloved son. And so it is in the tribe founded by Puru, the Pauravas, that the Vedic tradition starts. And so his descendant, King Bharata, starts the Vedic tradition. You know, his court priest, uh, Bharadwaj, is the first Vedic Rishi. That's all on the Saraswati. But so, apart from the Saraswati area of the Kaurava tribe, you have, as an immediate horizon of the Vedic people, you have the five tribes. The Kaurava is one, then you have the Turvasha, the uh, Yadava, the, um, 
Trujillo and the Anawa on their four sides. But that's not all. Those are the descendants of Yayati, who himself was part of the Lunar Dynasty, next to which are the Solar Dynasty, and they stem from two children of Manu, who had in fact ten children, you know, that have also not been lost. So there was already a wide landscape of Aryans, as they are called, and so the Vedic tribe is only one among them. Uh, so it's not true that all of India, all of the Indian languages, or religiously all of Hinduism, descended from the Vedas. That's a mistake. That's in fact a mistake that is very much supported by the Aryan invasion theory. Because what the Aryan invasion theory says is that the Aryans entered India somewhere in the fiber paths, they settled in Punjab, they wrote the Vedas, and then they moved on to Bengal, to Gujarat, and so on. And so all those people are descendants from the Vedic tribe. Now that's not the case. See, since the Aryan division theory is not true, many of its implications also have to be rethought. And in fact, in this case, it's fairly easy. You see, Hinduism is not the Vedas as many Hindus nowadays still say. Why? Because there are other traditions that are equally legitimate and have equally left deep traces in currently practiced Hinduism. Like uh, this whole goddess cult, which is mostly focused in, uh, in Bengal, but which is really present everywhere. You have this strict asceticism of Buddhism, Jainism, <coughs> that is mostly associated with what is now Bihar. Again, you see widely present, like there are these naked, wandering ascetics being described in the Vedas itself, though it was not the religion of the Vedas, they described it in the third person. Uh, but anyway, so that, that, that strand was there, then the Vedic sacrificial religion was there, and so everything you find in Hinduism was already there, with a certain focus on this or that area. Uh, but so that's all legitimate, that's all part of Hinduism. Okay, now some linguistic evidence. Uh, the whole idea of language families, you see some people say, oh this was concocted by the British in order to by the colonization of India. That has nothing to do with it. And in fact, the idea of an Indo-European language family is only the application of a, uh, an idea that had already been applied before to another language family, namely Uralic. Uralic which comprises uh, Finnish, Estonian, Hungarian, and a few more of these uh, languages in Northeastern Europe and Northwestern Asia. So this was already um, mapped out in the 17th century. This has nothing to do with race because all these people are more or less uh, the same, are, are white, and uh, as are the scholars who mapped it out. So here race is not an issue, colonization of really, though maybe if you look into the power politics of Sweden and Russia at that time you find something, but I don't think so. Um, so that's quite politically innocent. And so that method is also applied to uh, European and Indian languages to make up the Indo-European family. Um, I mentioned the crucial role of the French Jesuit Kermadou. Um, so I cannot stop Hindu militants from saying, oh, this is a missionary conspiracy. Yeah, well, maybe. Um, but you see, these missionaries, like especially the Jesuits, are pretty thorough scholars. And so they, they made, for instance, the, the distinction between Indo-European and Dravidian. You see, if they had wanted to convert all the Indians and use this idea of a language family somehow in their missionary project, then they would have included the Dravidian languages also. Yet they didn't. You see, they said, you are not part of the club, you are. 
and, and within Europe, they also made that distinction. Not all Europeans were included, like the Hungarians, the Finns, those we just discussed. You know, they have a separate language, family, or Ali. So it's just a legitimate theory based on facts. So it includes um, Celtic, Germanic, Italic, of which you have Latin, which later used the Romance languages. All the other members are extinct. Baltic, which is Lithuanian, Latvian, also Old Prussian. Because Prussian is really a Baltic language, it's not German. And so, because later the Germans conquered that area, you see, they retained the old name Prussia but they gave it a new language, German, instead of Russian, uh, the old name. The same you have, for instance, with Hittites. The Hittites were Indo-Europeans who conquered Anatolia, which then spoke uh, the Hatti language. Its capital was called Hattushash. So they took over that capital. They kept on calling it Hattushash. And so people outside, not they themselves, but people around them called them the Hittites, which is just the same word as Hathi. So they, they gave them the name of the people whom they had displaced. Um, you have Albanian, uh, Slavic, Greek, Armenian, Iranian, and Indo-Aryan. And then the extinct languages, Anatolian, Tocharian, uh, Thracian, and Phrygian, which were spoken in Bulgaria, Turkey. Um, and also Proto-Banglani, which is a remainder of a few dozen old words in this dialect of Hindi spoken in Uttarakhand. So in a bit more detail, it is the Italian uh, traveler Filippo Sassetti and the English traveler Thomas Stephens who first note a number of similarities between the languages they meet on the Indian coasts and their own language. And so that gradually gets worked out by first Jean Calmet, also a Jesuit in India, and then his student Gaston Laurent Coeur Du. You've never probably heard that name before. But so it is he who did it. Uh, William Jones was, you know, the man who made it popular. He was like intellectual enough, interested in languages, but not having the leisure and the, and the scholarly knowledge to, to make those discoveries himself. This new language family was called Aryan, uh, probably by Friedrich von Schlegel, I have not been able to trace it further back, uh, who um, reasoned that uh, the Vedic people call themselves Arya, the Iranian people also called themselves Arya, and so he deduced that this was probably the self-designation of the Indo-Europeans. We don't know that for sure, but we do know that the Hittites, the Iranians, and the Vedic people all called themselves Arya, and their enemies Anarya, which means that the Indians call the Iranians Anarya, and the Iranians call the Indians Anarya. But then later, you see, it became an effective name used by the others. So the people call the Iranians Iranian. The name Iran is Ayriana Kshatra, the country of the Aryans. Um, so that became simply a name of the, that people. Similarly, in India, it became a name of the Paurava tribe, the Vedic tribe, and therefore of the Vedic tradition. And so there, Arya comes to mean a civilized person, one initiated into the Vedas, and therefore noble, upper class, all those connotations. And there from it gets like used metaphorically in the sense of somebody of noble character. The same evolution that you have with the English word noble, which originally means dukes, earls, barons, and then gets transferred into a moral sense of somewhat of a noble character. Um, the, the, the meaning Vedic is of course also operative in the names of the South Asia, uh, South Indian Brahmins, Ayar and Ayangar, they are derivatives of Arya. 
because you see they came with the Vedic tradition in South India where they did not have the Vedic tradition so they stood out as Arya they had nothing to do with race but with that cultural difference that they were Vedic the others initially were not um, yeah right this is, uh, this is the explanation of the meaning of Arya uh, what more do you need to know so it is neither linguistic nor racial um, and so to say nowadays, as I still see many polemicists do on Twitter, uh, ah, it has no racial meaning, the ugly, vicious European racists continue to say, oh, you think this is totally anachronistic, nobody is using the word Arya in a racial sense anymore. But yes, you see, it, it was the case a century ago. Um, and so it's not really correct because it, in the tradition it never had that meaning. Oh yeah, some interesting factoid. Um, the Chinese do call themselves Arya. Yes, um, that's at least the thesis of a paper I read, and it makes sense. I mean, it's well argued. Um, the, um, the Iranians in Bactria, they call themselves Arya, okay? And so they conquered a lot of people around them. Uh, so it got the meaning of upper class, elite, the conqueror. And so they spread far and wide. Like you find this Arabian influence all the way to Japan. Um, so they spread from like Hungary all the way to Mongolia or so. Now there they're bordered on a Chinese kingdom, Zhao one of the, the, the warring states, that's a period in Chinese history. And so there also the elite call themselves Arya, which in Chinese becomes Hwa. And somehow this word has conquered all of China. And so now the Chinese overseas community are called Hwa. Or for instance, the name of Chinese Republic is Zhonghua Minghuo, or Zhonghua Renminguo. Um, so Hua means Chinese. So Chinese in the sense of civilized, you know, contrasting with barbarian. So that's the name, the, the meaning of Arya. Uh, so the enemies, by contrast, are called Anarya in general, or specifically the Dasas, or Dasyus, or Panis, or Asuras. Asura means God. And it's still used in that sense, for instance, in Germanic, the Aesir are the gods. Uh, so originally in the Vedas it has that same meaning, as has Deva, the two names for God. Now, it, the, the fashion developed that the Iranians mostly use the word Asura, which in their pronunciation becomes Ahura, uh, whereas the Vedic people use more Deva or in Iranian Daiva. So when they became enemies, uh, the word Asura came to mean the enemy. And similarly for the Iranians, Daiva came to mean the enemy. And the, that got demonized. So Asura becomes a demon. And similarly for the Iranians, a Daiva becomes a demon. And one of the devas in particular, namely Indra, uh, one of the epithets of Indra in the Vedas is Manu, you know, from, from Mama, the mind. Uh, so it means the, the mood, the character, and so on. He's called that. And um, so in Iranian, you have the notion of Angra Manu, uh, which means the angry mind angry passion and so on. Uh, it is probably a pun on the family name of the priests of Indra who are the Angiras. Um, so anyway, this, the name Angra Manu, later in Iranian becomes Ahriman, um, that name means Indra. And so Indra gets demonized, right? Strangely, one of the epithets, one of the other epithets of Indra, namely the Vertra Slayer. Vertra is the name of the dragon. Okay, so Vertrahan. 
that remains the divine name, Ikdarshan. So the, the character Indra is split into, and that happens all the time in the history of polytheism. There you see gods are doubled up and, uh, or evolve or get a different name, and then the old name reappears, because they're no longer a taboo on it, it's no longer a god's name. You see then it reappears, then one character becomes two characters, all kinds of things happen. So anyway, so Indra gets demonized, but Vartrahan does not. Yeah? Um, okay, um, so uh, the Dasas are very probably the Iranians, those who remain behind when their country was conquered by the Vedic Aryans. This is what the Battle of the Ten Kings is about. The Battle of the Ten Kings place in what is now uh, Pakistan, in West Punjab. There are two river valleys involved, of the Rauhi River and of the Chenab River. Now the Chenab at that time was called the Asikni. Asikni means black, so the Black River. Um, so in the Vedas there is a description of the enemy and they are called the people of the Black River. Um, so the Visha Asikni, the black tribe, all right, that's how it was translated. It doesn't mean the black tribe, it means the tribe of the Black River. And they were not black at all, the Iranians are not black. Um, so they call themselves Dasa, and in fact you see all the names, all the tribal names, all the personal names involved in this coalition of the Ten Kings, they're all Iranians. And so it's really, I, I really wonder how it is possible that translators of the Veda have never noticed this. Why do, why do they get the idea that these are the black aborigines? You see, black, okay, I can understand that there was a mistranslation, all right. But aboriginal, you see, it is said explicitly that they are coming from the west. You see, the Chenab lies to the west of the Rao, right? So the Vedic people are coming from the east, from inside India. They're not in Vedas. Uh, anyway, so they fight, and um, so King Sudas of the Vedic tribe is totally outnumbered. He's going to lose the battle badly and be forgotten in history. But then you see he gets a good idea and he crosses the river and he changes the whole strategic situation and then he wins and he chases the others and pursues them and so on. And it is said in so many words that they leave the country. And this is exactly what happens. The Iranians leave the country, they go to Afghanistan. And so their new heartland becomes Afghanistan. Zarathustra lived in Afghanistan. However, this country still has a largely Iranian population. So the elite moves out, but the rest stays there. It's like in biblical history when the Babylonians conquer Israel, they take away the elite that goes to live in Babylon, but the common people stay there. And um, so who are the Dasos? They are the Iranians who are still there, and they get a new elite uh, over them, who are the Vedic people, and who treat the locals as Dasas, as servants, and so that's where the Indian meaning of the name Dasa comes from. Whereas in Greek sources we have descriptions of the Dahai, the Dasas, uh, who's simply a tribal name among the Persians. Or like the Parnoi, another tribal name is the Pamis. So it's all about the Iranians, it has nothing to do with the black aboriginals. In 1816, you have the birth of Indo-European scholarship with the study of Sanskrit grammar and comparing it to uh, the grammars of better known languages at the time, like Greek and Latin. This is with uh, this is started by Franz Bopp, whom you see depicted here. Um, so from that point onwards, the study starts, and they're not far yet, you see, because 
here uh, in 1868, this uh, scholar, August Schleicher, um, he writes a story called Avis Aguasas Ka. Ka is Sanskrit cha, meaning N. Avis is Avi is a sheep, and Aquas yeah, is Ashwa, horse. So the story goes to the sheep and the horses. It's a story written in Indo European, Proto Indo European. Yes. So at long last, Proto Indo European acquired a literature of its own. And so, you look at that text, you see, it looks very Sanskrit. Um, it, uh, if you want to know it, you know, it's, uh, it means uh, Avis, Latin Ovis, where from, like English, you means a uh, female sheep, right? So a sheep, Yasmin Varna Na A Ast, you see, there was on it um, uh, no wool. Varna is in the sense with Ulna? No, in some language it's Ulna. Anyway, it means wool. Okay. It's related to the English word wool. Um, he saw Dadaka, Sanskrit Dadarsha. Uh, he saw Aquams, he saw Ashwas, he saw horses. Um, and so one of those horses was. Vagham Vaghantam. He was uh, making, you know, causing to move a cart, a wagon. And this was Garum. It was Guru. It was heavy. Right? So one of the horses is, is pulling a heavy uh, cart. And one of them is um, uh, Manu Aku Bharantam is swiftly Aku carrying a man, Manu. Um, what's the third one doing? Uh, yeah, he's uh, carrying Magham, Maha, something big. He is carrying a load. Hmm? So he's carrying a load and the other one is carrying a man fastly, you know, serving as an animal uh, to, to ride on. And so when the, the, um, the, the sheep sees this, he says to the horses, Vavakat, where you see the root Vak, to say, speech, right? Kard um, Agnutai, uh, my heart burns. Kard is hard, hardaya. You can see the Greek word Kard like in cardiologist. Um, uh, Vidanti, uh, seeing um, that a man, Manu, is driving on, is egging on a uh, horse, or horses, aquams. Now, um, in answer, the horses, aquasas, ashwami, they say, um well, kart agnutai is the same thing. My heart pains. It pains my heart to see we eat want. Um, yeah, we ourselves, we see something else. Namely, we see that Manus Patis, the, the, the masterly man, the boss, he has shorn your wool, your varnam, and he made himself Vastram Garmam, a vest that is warm. Garma, as is still said in India. Um, whereas you have no wool. He, he taken your wool, made a vest for himself, and he left you with nothing. Uh -huh. um, and so, uh, hearing this, Kukru wants, Kru is to hear, Shru in Sanskrit. Uh, he went into Agram, into the field, right? So, 
That's the first drawing prose I do. It looks very much like Sanskrit. You know, all the vowels are up, practically all of them. Whereas in, in Greek and Latin, you have e o, and like you have gegoma, whereas in Sanskrit, you have jagama. Okay? So at that point, this is 16, eight, uh, 1868. Proto-Indo-European, as reconstructed, still looked very much like Sanskrit. And so the idea that Sanskrit, that India was the homeland, was went with it. So that was still alive, though it was no longer the only thing. And so, but then after him, like two years after him, you get the, uh, the so-called neo-grammarians, this is pretty technical. But so then the outlook of Proto-Indo-European changes completely. And so today you have, below here on the slide, the new version of the same story. Now I can hardly pronounce it. <laughs> uh, uh, like, um, uh, for example, for example, the last word but one is hagrom. It's no longer agrom. It's agrom. Um, meaning feel. So you see that the vowel of the ending that has changed, am has become om. And so therefore the Sanskrit am will be a transformation of an original proto in the European om, which has been retained in Latin. Um, and so the initial vowel agrum <coughs> that has disappeared. But that was there in Proto-European, or at least that today is the dominant theory. And so what, what that says, you see, I don't dare to pronounce with all these Merindian sounds. But so it looks very different. And it looks a bit more like Latin and Greek and less like Sanskrit. Then um, some theories that the same Schleicher made the likeness of the family tree, uh, so that the language is all descent from a common stem, or from a common root, rather. Um, so against that, another linguist, Johanna Schmidt, emphasized the importance of the influence from outside. So when you learn a language, you learn it from your parents, and you learn to speak the same as they do. But then, because of your surroundings, new influences come in. New words from other languages, or new turns of phrase, and so on. So your language gradually <coughs> develops. But still, at the end of your life, it looks still a lot more to that of your parents than to that of any influence that you have met in your, during your life. So the secondary influence from the environment is there, gradually transforms languages. Nevertheless, the, the influence of the origin is still predominant. This is uh, Friedrich Max Müller. Uh, so in India, they, they, they don't know any of the people I just mentioned, but they do know Max Müller. And so they blame Max Müller for everything. They attribute the out of India theory or the, uh, the Aryan invasion theory to Max Müller. You know, for that it was not so important. He was simply an Orientalist who took the linguistic theories as they were at, in his time. Um, and he mainly concentrated on the contents of the Eastern languages, not on the language itself, but on the religious uh, texts that had been written in languages. So he edited the uh, sacred books of the East with uh, most of the Eastern classics, not just from India, also from Iran, from China. So usually it is depicted like this. So the center is uh, the Pontic area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So it is the far southeastern corner of Europe. And it is about halfway between the farthest western and the farthest eastern expansion. This seems very right, and I actually tend to quiz uh, Indo-Europeanists whenever I meet any. And so it turns out that this is a very, very, very common to say among them, yeah, you see that, that Pontic homeland is the most logical because that's just halfway. 
Now, that precisely is a good reason why it should not be there. Um, so this is the, called the Yamna area. Yamna means big grave in Russia. So they have these uh, archaeological finds of big graves where people are buried vertically. Um, so that's typical for that area. Um, but um, nowadays, some scholars say, and in my opinion, very correctly, that the Yamna culture is a bit too young to be the homeland. That in fact, it is a secondary homeland. That the first Indo-Europeans left the homeland and settled in the Yamna area and then proceeded onwards. And so we do know of an Aryan invasion of Europe from Yamna. The Yamna people went all the way to the Atlantic, butchering everything there. You see, we know that the male population in Spain, for example, disappeared. You see, genetic analysis shows that the women survived, you see, uh, but they were used by the conquerors. Right? So this was a pretty bloody story. You also see a complete change in pottery and so on. Um, so both archaeologically and genetically, you have ample proof of the Aryan invasion, but not of India. So, you see, that which is amply present in Europe is totally absent. But so, you see, these Europeans all came from this Yamna culture, but the Yamna culture itself was not the homeland, it was a secondary homeland. Ah, where was the first? Um, now, this halfway place, that's not what we expect at home. Why? Because all other languages that have mightily expanded, expanded not from the middle, but from a far corner. You see, for instance, Russian started in Kiev, which is now Ukraine. And it went all the way east to Alaska, like 10 time zones, about as far as you could go. And it went zero miles to the west. You know, many Russians went to the west. That is true, but there they found already established societies of the Poles, the Germans, the Hungarians, and so they adapted. So people may have spread deserved in investigation, but their language did not spread. And like a very good example is Bantu. Here you can see why these expansions are asymmetric. You see, very large part of the African population speaks a Bantu language. Now, the Bantu language family stood out because it happened to be the language of the first people who practiced agriculture in Africa. Now, agriculture is favorable for creating a large population growth because you can control your own food production. And so, you know, they had many children and they started expanding. They wanted to you know, have to land on their own. So they moved southeast. They started in about Nigeria, West Africa. They moved southeast, and there you have a very pleasant climate, you know, fertile land and so on. So they could practice agriculture in Congo, in Zimbabwe, all the way down to South Africa. However, if they went north, before too long, they bumped into the Sahara Desert where you can't press this agriculture. So there is no northward expansion of Bantu, only a southward one, right? And that southward one was very impressive. They went as far as they could. Uh, so that explains why these, these uh, uh, migrations are not symmetrical, because the reason why people migrate are not symmetrical. There's a difference between fertile land south where you can practice agriculture and the desert north where you can't. So, this is not proof, but it's a strong indication that it is not there um, uh, in the middle. Uh, as for the relation between linguistics and genetics, a lot of uh, hullabaloo has been made recently uh, because of some. Uh, publications on genetics that claimed that there was a big influx of people into India. Now, 
archaeology shows nothing of the Israelites. And so the jury is still very much out on that. But never mind. You see, if they say that, okay, let's go along with it for now, it is perfectly possible that there was an invasion. As a moment invasion, I say, yeah, of course there were invasions. And indeed, we know in Indian history there were plenty of invasions of the Shakas, the Greeks, the Hunas, the Kushanas, the Turks. Um, the Turks were Muslims who were animated by an ideology that was strongly separatist, that strongly favored maintaining their own identity, including their language. The Mughal court, you see, they were in India for centuries already. They had lost their own homeland in Central Asia. They were, for all practical purposes, Indian, yet they kept on speaking Persian, which was not even their mother tongue. And, but so, uh, they were animated by this strongly separatist ideology, so even in the field of language, they tried to maintain their separateness vis a vis and yet, they ended up assimilating. So none of those invaders has maintained his own language, let alone imposed his own language on the native And yet, that precisely is the scenario attributed to the supposed Arab invasion. They came with a bunch of horse riders, and they met this biggest civilization in the world that was literate and well organized and so on, and they converted linguistically all of this population without leaving it. I don't say it's impossible, but it's something. Incidentally, the out of India people have also used genetics to prove their point. Um, there have been some papers about some mean uh, I'm not a geneticist, so I will not hazard uh, identifying that gene, but anyway, so they, they uh, go around with this map showing the same genes in India, earlier in India, and then later also in Uva, which is the west, western Mongolia, the, or to the west of Mongolia, and eastern Europe. And so they say, so this is the island moving out of India, going a bit north, and then going west to Europe. Now, or, for instance, there are a number of studies of the genes of cattle. Um, this is about the cattle in Ukraine. I've recently, in fact, today itself, seen some more studies about Indian cattle being exported to the Middle East and so on. I don't mean as me, I mean as cattle. Um, so, in Ukraine, the cows turn out to be descended partly from Indian cows. Now, a cow does not migrate by its, its own volition from India to Ukraine because it has to cross the Hindu Kush mountains, which are not the natural climate of cows. Cows live in warm pastures and so on, so they live down below. They don't go there to the mountains, except if they are forced to go there by human beings. So we know that human beings have emigrated all the way from India to, to Eastern Europe. Okay, they certainly have done that, but my point is, all these migrations don't say anything about what language they spoke. You see, they may have come in a, among another population and taken those people's language. Um, we know, we already knew from the beginning, in fact, that Indo-European has crossed a racial frontier. Either it was white people imparting their language to the brown people, or it was brown people giving their language to the white people. But very, very, very certainly they crossed a, a racial frontier. So physical characteristics do not determine the language. So you see this, this whole commotion about recent genetic findings only shows that the people doing all this don't understand the stakes of the debate. The debate is not about whether people move. Yeah, of course, people move. The question is whether a language moves. And so there, I think that the evidence mostly points in the direction of India's homeland migrations towards Europe. 
Right, I guess the time is up, so yeah. uh, if, if we can continue this in interactive format, I am open to that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.